אז קודם כל אני מקווה שאתם נהנים מהכנס עד עכשיו. אני... גילוי נאות, אני הייתי בצד החושש של המארגנים, אבל אני מאוד שמחה שהמשכנו עם זה, ואני חושבת שיש לנו כנס נהדר עד עכשיו, אני מאוד, מאוד אוהבת גם את ההרצאות וגם את ההשתתפות. אני שמחה שאנחנו פה היום. ההרצאה שלי היום, אז, אז קודם כל אני אעבור לאנגלית, כי אני לא יודעת לדבר באנגלית. אז today's lecture, uh, today's talk is going to talk about C++ ownership model. And we're not going to see a lot of uh, code. I'm, I'm actually not focusing, unfortunately, I'm not generally focusing on C++, though I will show what C++ have to offer. But I want to I wanna have a general review of how does programming languages uh, generally manage code, and it's not necessarily C++. And then we're going to go deeper into C++. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, C++ allows uh, pretty much every memory model, and it's a system language. It, allow, it allows you to implement pretty much everything. So, uh, so yeah, let's start. So as I mentioned, my name is Inbal Levy. Uh, I'm an embedded developer. I work at SolarEdge. Uh, I also uh, am an ESO C++ director, uh, LEWG, which is the Language Evolution Co-Chair, and SG9 uh, Ranges Group Chair. And I don't know if any of you heard of the Ranges uh, uh, utility, but I, I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a great one. And, and Israel uh, and B-Chair. Uh, I participate in ESO meetings. I teach C++. I sometimes publish C++ papers and, and articles when I get the time to do that. And I think it's fair to say that I'm really into C++. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy the talk today. So let's start with the question. Why should you care about ownership? So I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase algorithm plus data structure equals program. I haven't invented it. It was uh, by, uh, the title of a book written in uh, 1976. Uh, but I have a paraphrase of that, uh, which is calculations plus data equals software. I think one level beneath algorithms and data structure, we basically have calculations and we need to load data. And this is how we build our softwares. So it's pretty clear. And what can you do with memory ownership? So assuming that you care about performance, you would like to manage your memory. Uh, you can define a memory pool, for example. So, uh, of course, you can always use the default uh, that's provided by your operating system, or if you don't have an operating system, the allocator that is provided. But if you care about uh, uh, limiting your memory or you care about performance, you don't want to take the, the memory from the heap, you can use a memory pool. You can define a private heap. heap. So, I will, I will show in this talk uh, some other languages and what do they do with memory, and part of that is defining a private uh, a heap. Uh, improved security. So let's say you don't want to, uh, when you allocate memory from the heap, and I'm focusing in this talk on dynamic uh, memory allocation, but it's not, it's not. Uh, I, I want to talk generally on ownership, but this is the specific part that, that we care about. So let's say you want to take memory from the heap, and you don't want to, uh, someone, uh, you, you can't, uh, for example, because of performance, something else, you don't want to erase it, you want to reuse it, something. I, I'm not sure why would you do that, but that could happen. Uh, then you can, uh, when you leave this memory for yourself during your program, you can basically um, uh, be less, uh, improve your security by not letting other uh, um, programs using your memory. So that's, that's also an example. As I mentioned, the, the clear thing is you can improve performance. Uh, define shared memory. Sometimes uh, you want to you wanna specialize shared memory between different threads of your program. <clears throat> Limit memory usage. So again, you can do that by using pool, or you can do that by using arenas. We will see later arenas, which is uh, what happens in Python. I think it's also interesting. 
Uh, monitor memory usage, as I mentioned, you can uh, collect statistics on your memory. So if you allocate with your special allocator, you can um, map what, what happens to your memory and, uh, and be able to monitor it and collect statistics. And add metadata to an object. Let's say I want to allocate an object, but I want to also add some uh, description in the beginning of the object. If, if I could um, do my own allocations, I could add that to the beginning and, and manage this data by myself. And many other things. So what does ownership mean? So I was thinking about this talk uh, and I, I was trying to uh, get the clearer definition of ownership. And again, this is a, a design talk. As I mentioned, it's not focuses on, on the code, but I think it's very interesting to, uh, to think what we, wanna, what we wanna talk about when we talk about ownership. So clearly objects are stored in memory. Ownership basically addresses two attributes. The first one is the memory. And the second one is the value. So when you own uh, an object, you care also about the, val the validity of the data. Uh, the owner of the object can basically do three things. Update the data, invalidate or move the data. So you, in, in, by moving the data, you invalidate your object. And you can free the memory. So basically, that would be erasing the object. So each uh, ability has a different effect of the program. So again, when I address uh, ownership in this talk, I, I've considered the following. So we can, uh, I, I would say that we can basically map uh, events in the program that cause ownership uh, uh, change. So I would, uh, first you, you could address moving an object. So basically if you call std move, you move the object and you, and you create an ownership event. Uh, you can pass the object as a function param. So once you pass the object to, as a function param, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, uh, you, you get a stack frame and the object is copied if it passed by value, not by reference. So I would call that uh, another ownership event. And the third thing is returning an object from a function. And that's pretty much how C++ addresses the ownership events. Uh, like more technical specification, but this is pretty much what, what it says. So, uh, and, and again, I wanna emphasize that we can have our value level ownership, we can have a proxy, so basically uh, smart pointers would be a type of a proxy because they manage the ownership, but they don't, not necessarily like they manage the data, but they also add something uh, to, to the ownership uh, model that we have and in direction, which is a clear uh, pointer level. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, static memory is the memory known to the program when it's uh, con uh, constructed. So you would call it compile time, and dynamic memory is the memory known to the program when it runs, aka runtimes. So we don't necessarily always know what, what's the memory that we're gonna use in the program. So let's talk about compiled languages in general. Uh, you have an IDE, uh, so basically we write the program and we generate the code and give the, the, uh, give the code that we wrote to the compiler which uh, creates the executable. And now we can take this uh, executable and move it to a different machine, assuming the, uh, the implementation uh, suitable. And then we run the executable on a different machine. The uh, stack, again, I'm talking about classic uh, C++ uh, compilation and not referring to libraries, et cetera. And when the program that we created needs additional memory, it will approach the heap and say we have an OS operation system for simplicity. So it approaches the heap and requests for additional memory. So keep in mind that when we compile the program, we're sometimes running on a different machine that doesn't have anything to do with the machine that we're running the program on. So that's, that's an interesting aspect, I think. And managed languages clearly do something different. So we write our program, and then we move the program to the target machine. And when we run the program, we have a manager that runs the program for us. So that happens in Python or JVM, uh, et cetera. And sometimes, or usually uh, a, lo a lot of cases, the manager have its private heap. So 
You don't, when you run the program and you need initial memory, you don't approach the o OS, you basically approach your manager. So the manager usually allocate, create, destroy, and free the objects. So again, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, I'm gonna briefly go over a C++, a simple C++ program memory structure, and then I'm gonna move uh, on to different languages. So uh, we have the read-only uh, uh, area, which contains the text and, um, and the code uh, and the uh, instructions. Uh, we have the BSS, which is a um, zeroed area. The heap, uh, mapping of our shared library into our process memory uh, memory area, the stack, and of course, uh, usually, again, I'm generally speaking on, on uh, currently on Linux, etc. but we have the kernel virtual memory uh, mapped into our process uh, memory area. So uh, usually stack size will be defined by, by the OS, by files, params, or commands. And process memory is created and managed uh, by OS, including caching, for example. So uh, we had a talk here uh, earlier by Avi that talked about caching and improvement of, of uh, having hot cache, et cetera. So when, when you, uh, usually when you write a C++ uh, program and you don't, you don't do special things to manage your memory, you basically uh, count on the OS caching uh, utilities. So heap allocations in general, again, this is not a talk that focuses on the code, it's talk this just trying to, to, to emphasize ideas. So uh, I, I did a, a small uh, um, buffer, um, small benchmark on my machine, and I got that it's between 10 times to 18 times slower than uh, stack allocation. Of course, it depends on your machine, but this is a, a general rule of thumb to consider. Okay, so what do we have in Python? So as I mentioned, Python have a memory manager. We run our program, and Python have its special allocators that basically run on the background. And if it needs additional memory, it will approach your op operation system heap. Okay, so basically Python can grow until the uh, process uh, um, uh, interpreter will have to be uh, exterminated by the, by the OS if it reaches some, some level of, of memory. And, uh, and, and again, Python have its specialized allocators. So you can, I think it's interesting from design perspective, uh, basically when you can specialize your allocators, you can, for example, use pools that, are that, are, that contain uh, um, certain um, uh, chunks of memory, and this could uh, also known as buckets, if you're familiar with this term. So I think it's, it's very interesting that Python have chosen this direction. And objects that are uh, bigger than half k kilobyte would go, uh, uh, would use the pi object functions and will usually uh, catch the, the gil. And otherwise, we can also use uh, pi malloc allocators. So again, this is just, I, I'm not going very deep into this model, but I think it's, it's interesting to see uh, the from the design perspective. Uh, so uh, Python also have arenas. So the idea of an arena is that you can allocate a certain amount of memory in advance, and uh, this one's actually been allocated by, by demand, but I'm, in general, uh, you can allocate memory in advance, and since you know, uh, for example, if I'm running as an interpreter, I know that I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna use the same memory over and over, so I don't have to, for example, erase it or um, uh, do special, I, I, could, I could basically manage it however I want. And when the interpreter goes down, the arena is being released as, as a chunk. So this could uh, have optimization, uh, this could uh, create optimizations by, by being able to free the whole memory as a chunk. You don't have to, uh, make sure that each object is freed by itself. So, as I mentioned, Python have arenas, and uh, they're usually on the size uh, of 256 kilobytes, and they contain pool, pools, and if you, and they're by itself divided into blocks, and if you need additional memory, uh, first of all, arenas are a linked list, it's a linked list that's called usable arenas, 
if you have uh, the need for additional memory, you can allocate from the OS clearly, just like uh, just like I mentioned before. And in a, uh, additional to the to the arena, you can also use uh, the PyMalloc, etc. So JVM. So the memory structure of JVM is uh, first of all we have a method area. So this contains everything that you would have think of uh, as a metadata of C++, for example, the classes, definition, constructors, superclasses, uh, metadata interfaces, etc., and the heap area, uh, which stores uh, objects, clearly. So once you get, uh, once the heap is full, a garbage collector can clean this area. So take into consideration that uh, these are usually uh, being allocated when J JVM is, is uh, startup of the JVM, of the um, um, code that, that manage that. And by demand, you also have the stack area, which allocates memory per thread and registers and uh, another uh, uh, special type of stack. So if you use, during uh, Java, you use uh, C code, for example, you wanna, and, you, and you wanna have uh, a regular stack, uh, what it's called, so th that would go to this, uh, to this area on your JVM. So again, we can see here that we have uh, special uh, um, areas which are um, basically uh, being uh, de de dedicated for, for, a certain, uh, for a certain task. So clearly you could do pools when you have this sort of thing, you could do pools because uh, basically what Java does is it allocates very small stacks and then you could, uh, um, sorry, not small, but like regular size stack, what you would have called for, uh, you, would, you would have known for, uh, for uh, a general progress uh, process, but you could also get additional uh, memory from the, from the JVM. So once you allocate something on the heap, you also get some kind of pointer and a stack area. Uh, basically, it's a reference, just like we know already in C++. And uh, there's four types of references uh, that you could also customize by yourself if you need to. So a strong reference, which is basically, uh, them, um, basically express full ownership, a weak reference, uh, doesn't have any ownership. A soft reference, which is cache ownership, that means that this could be cleaned when you need to uh, run your garbage collector, it will go there first. And a phantom reference, which is basically uh, just like a ref count, and when it goes to zero, you can free this memory. Again, this is all being done behind the scene, of course. Uh, it's not, um, in Java, you could explicitly call the garbage collector, but you don't need to. So um, I'm sure that looks familiar to you. Uh, I'm sure you, you're familiar with the similar concept from C++. So, okay, so this was the design part of the talk, uh, which is the main part, because I thought it was very interesting to see different design aspects. But let's go back to C++ and see how, what we can do in C++ to, uh, for example, implement those sort of things if, you, if we would like to. So as a sync system language, as I mentioned, C++ have uh, a lot of implementation freedom. Memory management, as I mentioned, addresses first allocation and then the data. And there are multiple uh, tools available, both in the library and in the language, to do those things that we just saw in C++. So let's start with the library. So smart pointers, I, again, I don't want to go deep into that because it, pretty sure that uh, a lot of you are familiar with this concept. If not, you're most welcome to look for it. So basically, uh, what it does, it's smart pointers are um, promising clean exit. So when we don't allocate by um, directly to the heap and, and, and uh, get the pointer, et cetera, but we use smart pointer, then we can uh, sort of delegate our, our the, the responsibility and again, the ownership on our memory to a different part of the program. So uh, they wrap raw memory uh, and they verify the allocation, of course, and each my portent type uh, expressed in different ownership model. Uh, so as you saw uh, just before in the Java, so we have, we have the same thing uh, in C++ and that's basically 
it's, again, it's not surprising, as I, as I mentioned, C++ is really in the root of, of all things. So unique pointer, and it's a single owner model, and I'll run a bit faster. And uh, you, you have one problem with unique pointer. So because of the ownership model, you can't do um, ownership events with unique pointer, the ones that we saw before. So of course the solution would be either to pass uh, by reference or to have stood move of the, of the ownership. And that's, what I, that's why I think it's, uh, it's an interesting perspective of the ownership model that you can basically, um, you, you can basically guarantee that there's only one owner at the time and that even from simplicity aspects of your program that guarantees that it's not gonna have two different um, instructions. So I, I would, if I have this uh, object that I wanna manage, I want to make sure that it doesn't get uh, multiple um, instructions or, or multiple, um, I would say, management orders um, that conflicts. So shared pointer is clearly a multiple owner model. And again, I wouldn't go deep into that. And weak pointer is uh, allowing non-owner um, model, which is very similar to phantom reference that we saw on Java. So if I would have gone to implement uh, something uh, like JVM, I would keep those in mind. And uh, again, in order to use weak pointers, we also ha always have to convert them to shared pointer because in a way, once you have a weak ownership of something, you don't want to give it instructions. So allocators, which is I think the most interesting thing um, in, this, in this aspect, uh, they can, so, so basically you can define how to, uh, how to allocate your memory. All the things that I've mentioned before, collecting statistics, um, doing special method, adding special metadata, etc. And uh, there's a lot more to it. So basically um, allocators need to define four main functions. So I don't know if you've uh, been working with allocators or not, but I will mention those and I wouldn't go deep into the details because that would need a separate talk of an hour and a half at least. But uh, basically what you need is you need to have uh, the allocate function, uh, the deallocate function, which are both being able to allocate and deallocate object. And you can construct uh, arrays or, or series of, of those objects by uh, constructing and destroying. So, when you use uh, standard library um, facilities, say containers, uh, std allocator is the default thing that's been called. Now it doesn't do pretty much, it doesn't do anything other than allocating from the heap as you already uh, probably know. And uh, one thing that you could do if you wanna collect statistics or monitor your memory, memory management, you could uh, extend uh, a std allocator by uh, overriding uh, its functions and call the base functions, et cetera. And that's how you can um, use, you can specialize your allocators. Uh, and when you do use uh, std all uh, allocator in containers, uh, please uh, make sure you use allocator trait and uh, wrapper, and this verify that your allocator is doing what it needs to. Now, I, I put a, um, uh, uh, it's not exactly all that needed to be done in order to define an allocator. You also need to have additional functions like bind, etc. But again, this is not a technical, uh, I, don't, I don't go in deep into the specifications uh, in the technical aspect, but uh, keep in mind that this is the main functionality that you want to provide. Uh, something that was added recently, uh, stood PMR. I don't know if anyone have heard about it, uh, but this is a polymorphic memory resource. And uh, the namespace is basically uh, coming to, uh, it's, it's, it, the facilities were created to solve the, the problem of having a specialized uh, compile time type of, um, um, uh, sorry, um, container. So, once you give an allocator to a container, let's say I create a vector from the standard library and I give it my specialized allocator. 
So now I have a vector that is specialized, a template specialized for a specific type. But this creates a problem that propagates the need to have uh, strongly typed functions in my entire code. And this might be um, a, an over, a burden on, on our code base. So std PMR was created to uh, allow polymorphic um, resources. And basically, uh, you could use facilities from there to uh, create a vector of int. So example, uh, for example, std PMR vector of int. And it doesn't care about the allocator that you gave. So this would be um, simplifying your code. So I think, um, I think in a way, uh, allocators are underappreciated uh, or uh, being avoided from. Usually, I mean, it depends on your code base. It depends on what you're trying to do. You wouldn't necessarily need them, but when you do, I think it's an interesting facility to uh, overview. So another thing that we have is our language facilities. So language facilities in C++ are usually, uh, when I say language facilities, I refer to uh, move. So move defines uh, move uh, uh, special functions of the objects and, and et cetera, define uh, uh, I what, what I would call a split ownership of, of an object. Because when you write the, cr the class, you define the move functions. So you tell the user how would your objects uh, behave when we being moved from. But the user is the one that calls a specific type would, would, if it's an L value or R value. And in this way, it also um, defines how would this uh, part of memory uh, behave. Um, OK, so I'm going to skip of copy elision, uh, fortunately, because I don't have enough time. And uh, OK, I, I, I will point out that um, copy elision optimizations were made um, uh, mandatory since C17. So basically, it means that when you pass an uh, object to a function, on or when you return an object to a function, um, you could, uh, the, the compiler could basically um, avoid from the promise that it made to you by, uh, in the API. So what I mean by that is that if you assume that once you pass uh, an object to a function it will be returned, then uh, it doesn't necessarily what happens. So it's not necessarily what happens. So sometimes the compiler could, or basically as again, as I said, it's mandatory, the compiler could, instead of creating the temp object inside the function and returning it to the uh, calling uh, scope, it could skip a few steps in the way in order to have optimization. But on the other hand, this uh, breaks your, your ownership model. This breaks the way that you expect your um, object to behave. So when, when you do write your special allocator, uh, keep in mind that these sort of things can break your um, promises. And NRVO is doing the same thing, but for named values, so something that is created inside the function have a name, being returned, and not necessarily being created. Why is this important, Why is this important for allocators to keep in mind the RVO? So, for example, say I would like to collect statistics. And I'm assuming that once I create the object in the function and do things, so so I think it's not that I said it's not it's not that I'm uh, that I'm thinking that you should avoid um, because of NRVO RVO, but you should just keep that in mind when you do collect the statistics. The, the object might be constructed on the stack of the other function. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm getting to the end of my time and I'm two minutes uh, past the time. So uh, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with this, but uh, C++ had garbage collector utilities. They were removed in C++ 23. This is also already accepted into the language. And a few interesting proposals, which I'm gonna talk two words on each. Uh, implicit move, which basically fixes uh, for C++ 20, the implicit move uh, and return value ref. Uh, pointer lifetime in zap. So I haven't mentioned, I haven't went deep into that, but once you uh, 
uh, have ownership of your memory, you can also have special advanced utilities to use, with, uh, to use it uh, with. So point on lifetime in Zap basically says, I want to leave some information in my pointer so once I deallocate it, so that some other facility that goes over the code, for example, garbage collector, but not only, could get some information from, from this previously used uh, data. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, I think uh, th these you can also read by yourself. And I want to, I, a few takeaways from this talk. So you should consider data ownership um, uh, to, to improve uh, efficiency and correctness of your code. Uh, this is a design aspect of your code. So again, I, I, ownership is a, is a bit of a, a general term. I've tried to um, summarize my aspects of that here, but you, you can, you can ap uh, approach it in, in however you see fit. And it's a window to advanced facilities. So if once uh, you write a program in which you have to have garbage collector for some reason, and you, you have a special, uh, uh, special facilities that need to be, um, um, that you need to collect statistics on, then keep in mind that once you define your ownership model, you'd probably have, you did 70% uh, of, of the work. And changes are coming. So thank you, everyone. And